So I'm gonna tell you the secret to seven figures right now. Think about what is blocking you right now. What is the difference between me and all the other speakers I've seen? You know, money loves speed, wealth loves time. We stole the idea, we recreated it, we spent $2,500 on that ad, it made us over half a million. Tony, can I bring you up here for a sec? Saka, 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 Saka. All we did was sell and recruit 24 seven. I'm gonna blame myself, it did not work out. So I'm gonna just give you a tip, if that's cool, because you're starting off as a Please give me a warm welcome to Jerry and Nancy! Thank you, brother. What's yo, up? Yo. What's up? Be before. Hello. My mic doesn't work. They knew he was going to say some wild shit. All right, before we get. Can you guys hear me? Before we get started, it's a little, it's been a little dead here. You guys have been w looking at presentations, taking notes, but just do me a favor, everyone stand up real quick. Stand up, stand up, 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 up. All right, what are you guys here for? Like, why, why did you show up? You wanna get to seven figures, right? That's where most of you guys wanna get to. So I'm gonna tell you the secret to seven figures right now. And I need you guys to say it with me. Ready? Saka, 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 Saka. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jericho. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just playing, but guys, with that being said, Matt and I were super pumped to be here, to be with the entire Agency Lab family. This is where it all started for me. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. And uh, yeah, we're here to answer your questions. We didn't want to do presentations because we wanted to be super intentional. You guys can sit down, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> wait, wait, can I just say? First of all, I love Jerry. He's fine. I love this you too. Made, this guy makes millions and didn't know how to turn a mic. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, we could put a slide deck on our YouTubes. We're here for you guys. So this next hour, it's all for you, right? Think about. What is blocking you right now? Like really, really be introspective and ask yourself, what is holding me back? What is the difference between me and all the other speakers I've seen? So we're gonna take about two minutes, let you guys think of every question you can, get as deep, uh, get as vulnerable as you can, because at the end of the day, it's the things in your mind that hold you back, and if we don't address them, we never solve them. So take the next two minutes, think about some questions. What's holding you back? What's blocking you in your agency, in your life right now? And we're gonna go deep. We're gonna answer every single question we can. So take two minutes, write some stuff down. If you have a question, uh, raise your hand, but we're gonna give people like, what, two minutes? Think of their questions and go from there. That work? Cool, that works. so take, take two minutes. Joel was gonna interview us, but he's not feeling well. So, uh, so yeah, take the next two minutes, think of some questions, write them down, and we're gonna answer them. Think so? Let's do it. Go for it, first question. Here. I was gonna say, like, what's the first thing you do when you essentially part of the agency, right? Like, what's your mindset going into it? And like, what are your processes from having to go from zero to here when so like A through Z? Other than sales. I got a thought. If you want. I'm gonna Pass that one to Matt and then I'll answer. So there's only two things that I focus on when starting a new agency. Only two things. Selling and recruiting. Like that's the process to seven figures is never stop selling, never stop recruiting. That's it. So when we take over a new agency like Josh, Josh and I partnered like six months ago. We partnered at 20K a month. Three months later, he's at 150K a month. All we did was sell and recruit 24 seven. That's it. So when we take over an agency, we think about how good, how good can we get at selling and how good can we get our people? And that's it. So if you find good people and you have a good sales process, you scale, it's, it's really that simple. Does that help? Uh, cool. Uh, yeah, you guys can just pass it. Okay, cool. Um, so I work with a very specific mental health niche. Um, I have my 
marriage and family therapist license. And there's a lot of red tape around sales versus bringing on new patients and a lot of resistance with um, basically these clinic owners or therapists wanting to do sales to bring on new patients. I dissolved for that. I got a client success manager. I created a 180 page interactive ebook and everything. But I'm still having such a challenge with, you know, Patties and Selmas who are answering the phone or the clinic owners themselves having a kind of an ethical uh, challenge in their mind of not wanting to sell a mental health service. What do you think might be some good solutions uh, building a team for them or how would you go about solving something like that? So just to clarify, their problem is they don't want to sell their own service? That's correct. They want the leads to come in and they go, great, this is the service that you want, here's my credit card. Gotcha. So here, Jared, I'm not as loud as you. I would immediately reframe that entire problem. Like mental health is one of the most, is one of the biggest problems in the world. And if they actually can help somebody, they're telling me they don't want to, they don't actually want to help somebody. They're not going to sell their service. It's, it's a shift, right? Like if you actually believe in what you do, your number one priority should be helping as many people as possible. And you can't do that if you don't sell. So I would reframe it in their mind. You don't want to sell this. You're, you're doing a disservice to people if you don't sell this thing. Like mental health, people kill themselves, bro. And you're gonna let them kill themselves because you don't want to sell? Like that's how I would think about it. Now I wouldn't say that to them. But as somebody who struggled with mental health, like bro, if you could help me and you didn't, and you didn't because you were scared to sell me, like that's selfish. Yeah. That's selfish. So you gotta reframe that in their minds. So I tried to solve that by, okay. I wouldn't know other people are questions, but I tried to solve that by creating it. I have a mini course, everything, but it's still yeah. almost like an archetype of the person. They're so uh, empathetic that anytime they push somebody, so do you think it's a kind of pivot solution where we just do a lot of the appointment collecting for them, the deposit? It could be. Okay. It could, it could be smart for you to handle and eat that problem for them. At the end of the day, if you can eat your customer's complexity, you can charge way more. So if this is a complex problem for them, eat that complexity, handle it for them, build the sales team for them. And that allows you to increase the value of your service as well and how much you charge. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Cam. So when you made the transition to the info product, in terms of like the hybrid that you have now, yeah, I'm just curious to see how you got proof of concept that that would work in your niche. So did you pre-sell it and get people in as a test drive just to see if they would kind of get value from it and implement, or did you just go all in on it, build out the program and then sell it? So let's break this down real quick. For anybody who's not, just, Quick show of hands if you can. Who's familiar with the state AI in our agency? Okay, so maybe half the people, okay. So our agency is a little bit unique. It's a Facebook ad agency for realtors, but the thing we do differently is we coach the realtors. So it's done with you, right? It's Facebook ads, GHL, all that normal shit, plus coaching and training. So the question is, how did we develop proof of concept that coaching would be an increase in value to the realtors? Is that the question? Yeah, and more so because, you know, there's agency land, agency owners are yeah. more tech savvy, they're gonna implement the things that you give them. You go to realtors, they're probably not, right? right. I was just curious, because I don't believe there's, there's any other people doing exactly what you guys are doing in the space. How did you get a proof of concept that people would be more interested in that in a post like you're doing for you, so? Part of it is giving people what they want, or selling people what they want and giving them what they need. Realtor, 90% of realtors fail in the first five years. So realtors' actual problem is they suck at business. They're really, really bad at business. So they don't just need leads, they need a holistic solution. And every niche, bro, gyms, wholesalers, dentists, every niche, their biggest problem is that they suck at their business. So the proof of concept is, at the end of the day, they're not making money. If we can coach them and help them make more money, that's gonna, that's gonna be a, a viable solution right there. Gym Launch was, was the company we modeled. Gym Launch sold for 44 million. They were a normal Facebook ad agency that switched it to licensing, and then they coached. And we actually got to talk to Hermosi, um, and the biggest thing that Alex Hermosi told us, 
He said, I actually hate SMMA, his words, I hate agencies because it's a commodity. Leads are a commodity. You're not going to build a great business on the backbone of a commodity. So we knew we had to add something. We knew we had to do something better. And we saw that he proved it with Gym Launch. So we decided, why don't we just build the same thing? Um, as far as proof of concept, we didn't survey anybody. We didn't ask anybody anything. We just went for it. And it worked. Can, can I add one? Yeah. Okay. I'll shut up. <laughs> I, I think one thing that I have to say about this is, guys, I think all, all across our communities, across the people we know, the business owners that we know and serve, there's a, hung, a, a deep, deep hunger for knowledge and for leveling up, improving, and being surrounded by like-minded individuals. When you guys joined Agency Lab, how excited were you when you saw other people posting wins? You know, how pumped up were you to do the work and to execute? How inspired were you? And I think with a state AI, it really comes down to just this one thing, um, and that is, it is the coaching aspect of it. And I think if we look around, not just from a niche perspective, but just a human being perspective, and we just look at people as a whole, they want something bigger. They want to be a part of a community. Sergio says this all the time. Why do people pay for click funnels and they don't use it? It's because they want to be a part of a community. So I think if you can create that community atmosphere in your agencies, you're going to be doing something that, like you said, 99% of agencies aren't doing. And when times get tough, when the niche gets rough, and when people, you know, there, there's recessions and interest rates, et cetera, a lot of agencies are going to go out of business because they're not able to provide actual value because they are lacking community. If I can add to that, people are tribal creatures, right? So we feel safer when we're in a tribe. It's just a security thing. If you can create a tribe for your niche, like you solve so many deeper problems than just leads. You solve like a real social primitive and social problem for them, which is you give them a community. Right, like all of us are here because it's a community. That's, that's what we're here for. We feel safer when we're in a community. So if you can do that for your niche, you just solve a deeper problem, a bigger problem than just lead gen. Yep. Joe. You can pick the next one. I'm hot. Thank you. So a few of these speakers today have talked about, you know, looking for, you know, why, why are we here? My biggest reason for coming to this event there was others, but the number one thing is I wanted to find a partner. Mm. You two have been quite the effective partnership. So after the last week especially, I assume there's gonna be quite a bit of folks walking away from this event as new partners. What makes you two so effective as partners, and what should other people look for in partnerships to be as effective or more effective than you two? Yeah, well for first, uh, for starters, Matt and I don't talk to each other. <laughs> That's how we make our partner, no, I'm kidding. Um, He's but not kidding, bro. I, I hate talking to Sometimes we don't talk to each other. But no, in all seriousness, it's, I, I say this a lot. Um, it's, it's like a marriage. It truly is, is a marriage. And um, I'm super fortunate that I'm going to have this experience now with Matt. Um, and honestly, you know, if you, if you guys want to become a millionaire, the quickest way to do one is to marry one. So I'll just take half his money. But, uh, <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, I, I think... What people don't see is the unsexy side. Matt and I had a partnership before this, and I'm gonna blame myself. It did not work out. Um, uh, I, I don't think either one of us were in the right mentality or the right, we didn't have the, the level of skills that we have now um, to have an effective partnership back then. We started off as really good friends, like Joel and Sergio said, they were friends for a long time, giving each other, supporting each other, giving each other value. And that's how Matt and I developed our friendship, and that's how we knew we wanted to be partners. Um, but I think a few big things. It's, it's radical honesty, right? Like, I'm going to call him out, he's going to call me out. Um, and I think that's one of the most effective ways and, and reasons as to why we've been successful in a partnership capacity. I, I think we do that without having to actually do it, though. I think both him and I, we, 
want the best for the other person and we don't want to let that person down. So we're not going to mess up. We're not going to, you know, walk out of the business or, or do something that could hurt the business um, because we don't want to let the other person down. So I think it starts with that. So there's three reasons to partner with somebody, right? They have skills that you don't have, they have resources that you don't have, uh, or they have money that you don't have, right? So they either need to provide capital, skills, or resources. Jared had a lot of skills I didn't have. I'm an introvert. I don't like selling. I don't like promoting. I'm, I'm back end all day. Jared, as you can tell by the way he opened up the fucking talk, is loud and shit <laughs> and likes talking to people. So it made sense for us to partner in that capacity. I'll say what I think has made us effective. Layla Hermosi says in, in partnerships, you want an industrious person, somebody who's hardworking, gets shit done, and then you want an enthusiastic person. That dynamic's really powerful. You need somebody whose vision, loud, here's where we're going, here's why we're going there. Jared, like if you see Jared on a team meeting, he makes these crazy speeches. It's like we're going to the moon, bro. Like it's insane. And that's Jared. And then I'm like, okay, how do we actually build the rocket ship to get to the fucking moon? So that's why it works. Um, and then the other thing is, yeah, like we're just really honest with each other. Like it's, it's, it's a, we're just real. We're just real with each other. Like at the end of the day, he's like, like he said to me earlier, I'm like the brother he never had, right? I'm like the black brother he never had. Uh, <laughs> he, he thinks he's black. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's, that's basically it. Yeah. Does that help? Absolutely. Cool. And bro, if, if you stand up and you don't get a business part, like bro, if you guys look at this dude, he's 6'8". Partner with him, bro. Partner with him. Come on, give it up for Joe, bro. Give it up for Joe. <laughs> uh, let's go there. So my question is, what would be that the biggest mindset shift that either you notice, you encourage, or you maybe even have help other agency owners? to truly unlock and stop their self-destructing, self-sabotaging behaviors and start taking quantum leaps. Can you say the last part again? Right, so what, what are those behaviors? What is that, uh, that mindset shift that unlocks an agency owner from staying in a rut, being busy, playing on the lower, under six-figure mindset and start taking quantum leaps? What's that mind mindset shift? What's the mindset shift that takes somebody from six figures to seven figures? Or beyond. Or beyond. For me, it's having a team. One of my biggest fears in the agency is waking up one day and not being able to pay our team. Um, we have 25, 25 team members now, full-time team members. And we don't hire young people at our agency. Uh, whatsoever. Um, so I would say the average age, age is like 35, 40, probably. Um, and they all have families. Like th these are real jobs. People that have to put food on the plate, on, the, on their kid's plate and a roof over their heads. And um, I think when you have that, it's like, I, I, I've never had a kid, but I, I'd assume it's the same thing. When you have a kid, you have so, you feel so responsible for that person's well-being. So when you start adding team members, I, for me at least, that was the mindset shift. From six to seven, and then from seven to multi-seven, I guess, for me is realizing, you know, money loves speed, wealth loves time. And one of the difficult things that I struggle with, because like Matt said, I'm go, 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 and I don't care what I break, he's gonna fix it, it's not my problem. Um, and we're just gonna tear stuff down, right? Um, nothing's gonna get in our way. And Warren Buffett was, do you guys know the story behind Berkshire Hathaway and the third partner? Does anyone know that there was a third partner? Yeah? yeah? All right, one person. So there was a third partner, his name was Rick or Rich or something like that, right? And 
one day, a reporter asked Warren, what happened to that third partner? And long story short, that person made, he, he was like over leveraged, right? And because he was over leveraged and he, something happened in the, in the market, right? And he basically had to sell off his Berkshire Hathaway shares for $40 a share. Mm. If you guys know how much a share of Berkshire Hathaway is, it's a few hundred thousand dollars right now. He had to sell off for $40 a share. And Warren said, we, Charlie and I always knew we would be rich. We always knew we would be rich. But the problem with Rick was he wanted it, he was gonna go too fast. Warren said he wanted to be rich for sure versus rich quick. And I think that's one of the biggest learning lessons that I've had to uh, overcome to get to that multi seven figure market still is something I'm still trying to overcome. It's like that old marshmallow experiment, right? Delay that instant gratification. So. Tony, can I bring you up here for a sec? So, I want to ask Tony a question because you, apparently I wasn't, I wasn't here when you did your, the beginning of your presentation, but you said, um, you, sh you called me out, right? You, you put me in the slides and you said, uh, you asked me for radically honest feedback, right? Yep. We were at an event, we were hanging out. I was talking to Tony, I'm like, yo, this guy's so fucking smart, bro. So smart. But he was like, dude, what do you think I can do better? And I was like, bro, if you ask me that, I'm gonna give you a real ass answer. <laughs> and I said, I don't think you want it bad enough. And it seemed like something clicked for you. The next month you did 100K. So I'm curious if you could maybe tell people like what, what clicked for you? Because I think at the end of the day, like everybody here, if you're not doing at least 10K a month, like we're all capable of that. So the question is, do you want it bad enough? Do you really want it bad enough? So I'm curious, like what clicked for you and, and what changed after that convo? Thinking. <laughs> I think for me was, uh, I think first thing was like, man. <laughs> That's my first thought. Right? I was like, fuck. And I, that night, literally that, that same night I was thinking about, I was like, I mean, he's right. Right? And because the biggest thing that I hate a lot personally is people who say they want certain things, but they actually don't match what they want. And at that point, it seems like I was in that stage where I say I want this, this, this. Like, like I want to get in better shape. I'm, I'm not in insane shape now compared to. Back then, it was all better shape now. And I said a lot of different things, and I think it's, my action didn't match up, right? I, I really had to look at myself in the mirror and be like, do I really want it? I think that's the biggest, biggest thing, is that most people say that they want certain things. Because everyone here always wants to make money, right? Everyone here wants to make money? Yes or no? Yes, yeah. right? But then that's like, a, like, do you really want it? <laughs> I know what I would say, it's more like, I think, after that conversation, it went from like, I want to get to 100K a month to like, I need to get there. Yeah. So that was like the, the switch for me with talking to Matt. And shout out to Matt, man, like most people do not answer you. So I'm really grateful to have people like that in my life. But yeah, I think the biggest mindset shift, which is knowing that like, you don't, you don't get what you want, I think you get what you need, mm. essentially. So that was like the mindset shift. Yeah, we must have. Don't mess up the quote, bro. There we go. That's my quote. That's your quote, Sergio. Must have your thing. We can give it up for Tony real quick. Thank you, bro. Like mindset shift. Like, if you watch my YouTube, you know I talk about mindset a lot, a little bit too much. But at the end of the day, it's the game, right? Um, it's a little bit woo woo, but I keep it really simple, bro. Like, if you had 12 months to hit 100K per month or you died, would you hit 100K a month? Would anybody here not hit 100K a month if your life was on the line, if your mom's life was on the line? Like you'd hit a gun to your head, you know? You'd hit 100K a fucking month, bro. So that shows it's not information, you're not missing shit, you, you're j you just don't want it bad enough. So for me, like, my parents gave me seven months. They said, you have seven months to make a living from this SMMA bullshit or you're out of the house. I was 17, 
right? And I said, all right, I got, I got seven months. It felt like do or die. I worked 70 hours a week as a 17 year old kid. I didn't go to parties, I didn't do any bullshit. I just worked all day long because I felt like my life was on the line. If you woke up every day and you said, I have 12 months to make 100K a month or I die, every day, all you would do is work towards 100K a month. So if you can internalize that, if you can make that real, that's the best mind, mindset hack in the game, is understanding like this is do or die. And if you can internalize that, you get this like superhuman level of motivation. Cool. Let's get someone in the back, just in case anyone has a question back there. No one? Right there. Right there. What up? <laughs> so the biggest thing that I keep hearing is, hey, if you want to scale, do ads, do ads, do ads, right? And I'm looking for some specifics. And I know it's going to change based on each niche and everything else. So what I have here is a couple of them that you will go back and forth on. First thing is how much? Target, you know, what's the target budget? Uh, second thing is target CAC, target ROAS. Uh, what are your key KPIs that you're looking for? Uh, let's see here, and what are some indicators that you use to identify, hey, it's just time to kill Cool, let's get tactical. Can I ask you a follow-up question? What's um, What's your current revenue at? Or how many clients do you have if you, you don't want to share? Just starting, all right. Spend what you want to spend in a month Actually, give me two answers. Uh huh. Because I think it might help a couple people here. Okay. One for an individual that has resources at his disposal to make this happen. Yeah. And then the other one for you know individuals that are cool. maybe they've got to work a job for six months. Yeah, yeah. Some bread and you know scale up. So I, I'm sure Matt and I will probably give a similar answer. If you don't have the resources, cold call, door knock. Um, that's what we did. Um, I think if you have the resources, then what you intend on spending in a month. Spend it in a week. Shorten that, that time frame that it's gonna take for you to collect all that data and just spend it in a week. Uh, what'd you say? Give me a number. It depends on you. It depends on what you can do. 20K, 50K. If you can spend $100 a day, what niche are you in? I don't have a niche. Okay. All right, first let's pick a niche. We're about to build an agency live right Let's now, build an bro. agency build live build right now. Bro. Yo, all right. I would do like, uh, I would probably start off with $100 a day. Also, I would definitely be hopping on Isaac's ad calls, right? Um, I am not the best marketer. Matt, Matt could probably um, help you a little bit more with that. But I would probably start off by spending $100 a day, depending on the niche that you're in. Um, and spend what you want to spend in a month, spend that in a week. I think the next thing, you asked me a lot about ROAS, um, CAC. Dude, I, I just learned those terms last week like you don't you don't need to you don't need to know those right now so I wouldn't even I think you're just gonna overcomplicate and I think we should keep things very very simple I'm cool with the overcomplication you're already an expert in it so I'm just new to that so I'm basically that's what I'm saying got you um again it's 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 all relative like it depends on the agency I can't I, I don't want to just give a, a blanket answer out because I don't want you guys to set yourself up to a specific KPI and then you guys can't hit that KPI because your agency model is totally different than my yeah. agency model. I would say if you're trying to scale, you want to be at at least around a, a two to three X row as. Uh, you could be at two X if you have a lean agency. If you have a lot of team members, I would, I would look at the three X. Yeah. So I think our row as is what, like four or five X? Rev or front end? Front end. Or yeah, let's say front end, front end cash. Three to four. Three to four X ROAS. Josh, what's your ROAS? Like 11? Like seven, something crazy, right? So like there's just, there's just a range, you know? But it's really gonna come down to your niche. Um, I know you didn't ask this question, but I'm gonna just give you a, a, a tip if that's cool, because you're starting off SMMA. Picking the market is going to be the most important thing you do. It's the most important thing, it's the market you go into. The market is, is the game. So go into a big market that sells an expensive product that's gonna give you ability to charge more on the front end, that's gonna give you more leverage in your ads because you can collect more cash up front. 
right? Uh, but as far as how much do you spend, bro, as much as you possibly can. Before we built the state AI, I built five agencies and all of them went to like 10K a month, 20K a month, 40K a month, 30K a month, and then they crashed back down. Every single time I got to six figures and then went back down to zero. The difference with the state AI is I met Jared and Jared didn't give a fuck about money. So every time we closed a deal, we put it right back into ads. Every, like back into ads, back into ads, back into ads. We didn't take home any profit for like the first six months. It all went back into ads and recruiters. Never stop selling, never stop recruiting. And that's all we did. So how much do you put into paid ads? As much as you humanly possibly can, bro. That's it, every single dollar. Um, and if you view it as an investment, if you really internalize that, like bro, spend all your money on ads, you're, you're gonna scale up super fast. At what point do we kill? At what point do we kill ads? The way I like to media buy is two times cost per result. I want it to have at least two times cost per result. So if I want to get a $50 lead for a client or if I want to get a $100 booked call, I'm going to let it spend probably $100 to $200 before I kill it or not. Um, that's what I look for is two times CPA. Yep. Cool. Let's see. So I really resonate with the fact that you guys taught the world of emulating gym launch because I did the same thing. And like down to the point where like some of my original videos were literally saying, I hate agencies and running ads is easy. Just do it yourself. And I literally got banned from Facebook groups for putting up like tutorials on how to run your own ads. And I was just selling the coaching. I'm just now implementing the media buying for my clients because that was a spot I saw inconsistency. Is like mentally they wouldn't start ads because they were scared of spending money and everything. Like they had the money, they were just scared to press the button. But my biggest thing is how the have you guys gone ahead and differentiated the value in your offer, like in the sales process between a normal lead gen agency and what you guys do? Because that's one of the hardest things I've been seeing is trying to explain how we're different because we're not just better, we do something different. I got into this because I grew my own detailing business before I ever even started. It's a really important question. Um, people don't want something better, they want something different. So you have to figure out how are you different than all the other, there's 200 agency owners in this room alone, how are you different? Um, the first, like the very first slide of my demo is here's what most agencies do, here's what we do. And I just draw the gap. And like, honestly bro, what we do is the same as everybody in this room bro. It's like, it's the same fucking shit. It's like, yo, we run ads, we use GHL, we have a lead qualification process and we nurture the leads via AI technology, which is GHL. And, you know, a little bit of, we got a little bit of AI in there. Right? It's not complete for most. <laughs> but like ultimately, you, you make it, you, you use a little bit of marketing language. They're not going to buy for your product. They're not buying for that. They're buying because they have a clear source of pain and because you show them a dream solution. The little details, bro, like a, a good tip I learned when I was a young salesperson is don't sell features, sell benefits. Sell the end result, sell the vacation. So make yourself different, but ultimately understand that's not what's going to make them buy. They're going to buy because there's enough pain brought out on the discovery call and they see a potential to get to a dream solution based on what you've shown them. Um, but yeah, just like literally map it out. What do most agencies do? Here's what I do differently. And even if it's the same thing as everybody else in this room, if you just tell them this is different, they'll say, oh yeah, that makes sense, it's different. <laughs> Straight up, you got anything? I think the only thing I would add to that is what are they seeing on the front end, right? Because when all your agency ads, and I've seen all your agency ads, because I, 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 I study ads all the time, and they're all the same. It's 1080 by 1080, 10 adjustments guaranteed, they're 10 chiro clients guaranteed, right? It's all the same stuff. And I think that's where a lot of people fall into the trap. Your funnels look the same, your marketing looks the, the same. So of course, people are gonna hop on a call with you. They're also gonna hop on a call with your competition that also has the same funnel, the same type of ads. So obviously they're gonna ask you, what makes you guys different? When people hop on our sales calls, yeah, we get that question. But we also get, a lot of times, you guys just, what you were doing was just different. Your ads were just different. People will just say it to us because on our front end, it's completely different from what everyone else is doing. Yeah, real quick. 
Alex gave, I don't know where Alex is, um, but he gave some of the best ad advice that can be given, which is steal. Like steal those commercials and make them for your niche. Good, good artist copy, great artist steal. The best ad we've ever ran, best ad, we, you, you know which one. The real estate rap. Has anybody seen the real estate rap? Just curious. Okay, a couple people, yeah. Even Y'all aren't realtors, but you know the ad. So we saw this guy two years ago. He had an HVAC agency. And he, ha he put some ad on his Facebook. And it was like some rap song for HVAC owners. It was like, it's getting hot in here because my AC won't blow. Like, fucking Nelly remix or something. And we were like, okay, cool. What if we made that for real estate? So we just stole the idea, we recreated it for our market, and then we made a rap song that was basically a diss track to Zillow and all these other Facebook ad agencies for realtors. We stole the idea, we recreated it, we spent $2,500 on that ad, it made us over half a million. We stole the ad, we made it better. That's it, steal and improve, steal and improve. So that's the, the best thing you can do on the front end as far as marketing goes. I know that wasn't exactly your question, but just a, a thing to think about with your paid ads. What can you steal and how can you make it a little bit better? David Ogilvy, the best advertiser in history, he said, the most dangerous word in an advertiser's lexicon is originality. You don't need to be original. You need to steal what's proven to work and make it better. So if you can do that on the front end, uh, you'll have a lot more success on the sales calls too. Okay, awesome, thank you. That's how I would do it again. But then you mentioned in the demo call, like have a slide, that shows like where you're different. Yeah. We actually stopped doing video calls altogether because we had like a sub 10% show rate and brought it up to like 70% just by switching to phone calls. And so we noticed detailers, the thing is they'll get an appointment, they'll leave and they'll forget. But then if you call them, they'll sit in their car and they'll take the phone call. Uh. So how would we then go ahead and maybe show them, should it be a VSL? Should it be a short clip we send them after the discovery call? What should it be? You can just tell them. I mean, you don't need to show them a demo. We don't use demos at our agency. I close with demos because I like demos, but our closers don't use demos. So you can just tell them, here's what's different. Same thing, it's just verbal now instead of visual. Okay. Yep, cool. Who's next? Uh, let's go here. Yeah. By the way, we'll go ahead and get three more questions. Awesome, thank you guys. Uh, so you've gone through multiple iterations of product and services that you sold. Yeah. You guys probably have more experience than anybody in this room, or at least most, on fine-tuning pricing and packaging. And we've heard a ton today already about how do you maximize upfront cash and PIF so that you have the bandwidth to be able to outspend your competition, something like that. But there's also a balancing act of making it low enough that people can have a, a low enough action threshold to move forward. How do you guys think about pricing? Is there a framework that you use based on the value you provide? I'm curious your thoughts. This answer is not gonna be what you guys have. <laughs> but we have, for how long have we been doing this? Two and a half years? Yeah, two years. For two, two years, we have not changed our pricing while we've added a tremendous amount of value to our service. Um, and to be honest with you, um, I've talked to Matt about lowering our pricing. Um, I've never been one to, we've done it a few times where we've raised prices and we, and, and we do have packages like that. But I prefer the volume approach. I prefer to get a lot of people in on the front end and then we're gonna upsell them, uh, retain them, et cetera, on the back end. Um, but it's also gonna help out with economies of scale. Our cost of goods, is sub $150 a client. And that's just because of economies of scale. So the more clients we can get in, the more profitable we're gonna be. It doesn't, it doesn't really constrict our agency at all because of the way that we built it. So I don't, for us, I don't think we need to raise pricing. Um, and to be honest with you, no, we don't have a framework. It's, it's what Sergio said, we just pick the price. Um, yeah. And it works for us. Um, so yeah. So you're focused far more on the ascension ladder on the back end rather than the pricing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Do you want to talk about biggest failures and stuff that we learned, especially with selling? Sure. Uh, yeah, if you, if you want to. Yeah. yeah. How has finding God? <laughs> <laughs> How has finding God affected your overarching goal, money, business, life?
For me personally, I don't think I would be here without religion. I, <laughs> I genuinely believe that everything that has happened is because of a higher power. There's no reason as to why Matt and I should have met. There's no reason as to why a kid with a speech impediment who rode the short bus should be on the stage speaking to you guys today. There's no reason why any of the good things have happened in my life, and it just happened. You know, we, are, we went through a period of time in a state AI where we were selling, and, or we were under contract to sell, someone wanted to buy the agency, and we had a lot of ups and downs. And um, we just started getting all these things that started happening to us. I don't know if our sales managers, Joseph, are you still here? No. Um, he did. He, said he did. <laughs> all right. But um, we, one day, just, do you guys know who Douglas James is? No? Yes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but his sales managers just came, somehow found us one day. They do like $3 million a month. And he wanted to be a part of what we were doing at Estadia. And we, there's so many other instances and scenarios like that where we've just had amazing team members just come to us. And we were just so fortunate and blessed. So for me, religion's a big part of it and I wouldn't be here without it. So that's my answer. The biggest thing I've struggled with in entrepreneurship is wondering why do I even play this game, bro? 